So today, uh, I'm James Kessler, and I'm talking about um, five decades of Great Lakes ice data. Oh, thanks. Um, so you can probably guess that this data set is older than I am. Um, so there's a lot of uh, folks to, to thank. Um, I've been managing the data set for about five years, but obviously it's that's about 10%. Um, so I, I probably couldn't list everyone who's contributed, but I tried, tried with all the names here. Um, and there's a bunch of agencies that I need to acknowledge as well. Um, most importantly, the US National Ice Center um, and its Canadian counterpart, the Canadian Ice Services, who have throughout the years worked with GLURL to make this data set possible. Um, but I'll, I'll get into that in the history. Um, so I just wanted to start with this, this graphic that shows really all 50, 50, 51 years of data that we have now um, in this sort of unique way. So, so each, um, each vertical bar here represents an ice season. Um, so time, time is progressing upward throughout the season from December to April. I don't know if you can see it. I think it's a little cut off perhaps. Um, so December is at the bottom of the, the, the y-axis and April is at the top. Um, and then the color indicates how, how strong the ice cover is, how, you know, the, the ice cover threshold. So it's sort of like a pseudo color map, but it's only got three colors. So 10%, 20%, and 50%. Um, so what you can see is ice cover is highly variable. That's what sticks out to me the most is that um, the seasons vary quite a bit as far as how much ice forms, um, when ice forms, how long the season is, but even um, the timing that that happens. So the bar is sort of shifting um, up and down on the graph. Um, I can highlight the, the 97, 98 El Nino, sorry, the formats, formats a little goofy there. That's, um, that coincided with at, at the time, the record low ice cover. Um, and then it was followed by a number of low, low ice years. Um, there have been many papers that have discussed um, this event and, and its, its impact for the thermal regime of the Great Lakes. Um, recently, we've seen a number of very low ice years. The last um, three or four have been, have been fairly low, um, but you don't have to go back that far to see 2014 and 2015 were very high ice years. 18 and 19 were also you know, pretty considerable. Um, so I think you saw this, this graphic when, when Debbie presented, um, so just about sort of where we were and where we are today, you know, we started with hand-drawn paper maps. Um, today we have geo-reference files, um, and I'll, I'll talk about those more in just a minute. Um, so I'll, I'll start with just some basic background and sort of ice data, uh, or sorry, ice cover in the Great Lakes. Um, I think I just have a single slide for this. Um, the second section is really the history, so that's, I think, most most significant, I think, for this for this session, talking about the history and the evolution of the ice data. Um, but I also want to get into some of the science and actually talk about you know what we can learn from this data. Um, so I'll spend a, a decent amount of time talking about the ice cover trends at sort of a large scale, like lake wide, uh, actually you know basin wide scale. Um, and then the last section, I'll just I'll just talk touch on some recent research that's come out over the last decade or so, which wouldn't be possible without this this great data set. Um, so ice cover, as I mentioned, in the Great Lakes is highly variable, both in space and time. Um, so, you know, shallower regions and shallower lakes have less thermal mass, so they tend to freeze faster. Um, it's also, you know, variable over the course of days. Um, if you can see in the, the upper graphic is showing all 51 years as a time series where each, each year is over, overlaid on, on the other years. So you can just see the, the huge variability throughout the season. Um, so in, in the middle of the season, right, you, you've got certain years that are ice covers 10% and certain years is 80%. Um, so it makes it a really interesting thing to study, a really interesting, interesting thing to predict. Um, ice cover impacts commercial navigation, um, which is a huge industry in the Great Lakes. Um, Land fast ice along the that's ice along the shore uh, dampens waves, so it, um, it has a big influence on uh, shoreline erosion, specific, specifically when when water levels are high, like um, Lauren Fry was talking about. Um, ice cover and evaporation have this complicated relationship. Excuse me. Um, so it was previously thought that high ice cover automatically meant lower or, or more evaporation happening, um, but there's sort of a new way of thinking about it that um, suggests that. Uh, ice cover more influences the, the timing of evaporation instead of the total amount um, because the lakes are cooling more during a high ice year um, and while they're cooling they're evaporating more um, there's a great paper that I I've, um, mentioned there um, ice cover influences biology uh, so there are certain species of um, fish and microorganisms that depend on the ice um, for for reproduction um, and of course as we know on land it influences the weather through thermal regulation um, and lake effect snow um, okay, so I'll get into the history now. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, th there's been this long sort of um, coordination between the U.S. National Ice Center and the Canadian Ice Services and GLURL. Um, and this is sort of the, the, a, loose, a loose workflow of the, the main data processing of the satellite data is done by the U.S. NIC and CIS. Um, and then the post-processing and a lot of analysis and um, archiving of the, of the data is done by GLURL. 
Um, so getting a little bit more into the specifics of, of how that looks. Um, and there's some little overlap here as far as inputs and outputs. Um, but the main, main inputs are satellite data. So synthetic, synthetic aperture radar um, is a really great, to, great tool to use. It, it can see through clouds, it's cloud penetrating. Um, it can distinguish between different ice types. For example, that land fast ice that I said is really important for, um, um, for wave dampening and, and other reasons. Um, it, it also is, is, is usable, usable day and night, um, which is really nice. Um, there are other inputs there if, if you wanna read them. Um, so as far as outputs, we've got a lot of um, various things that, that uh, various formats of, of the data that you can look at. Just JPEG images, charts, um, which I think are, they're sort of old fashioned, but I think it's really useful because they're still accessible to the general public. So you don't have to be a scientist that can, can write code to look at the ice charts. And I think that's an important thing to be able to communicate that to, to a broader audience. Um, the the data is available as gridded text. Um, we have lake wide um, values, both as plots and tables, which I'll, I'll be talking about when I get to the trends. Uh, and like I mentioned, the geo reference shape files, that's really important to do spatial analysis, right? Um, so that, that's again, um, a really valuable uh, um, data to have. Uh, so here's a timeline of, of the history. So um, the first Great Lakes ice um, sort of analysis was actually done by the, the Weather Bureau, Bureau. So it predated NOAA uh, in the 60s. Um, but uh, for the context of this timeline, in 1973, the, the Canadian Ice Services started producing those paper charts um, that I, I mentioned before. Um, it wasn't until more than a decade later that the US National Ice Center also started producing paper charts. Um, then in, in 96, um, computers were, were widely available um, and digital ice charts, um, the, the charts became digital basically. And they were a two and a half kilometer resolution for the digital charts. The paper charts didn't really have a resolution since they were hand-drawn maps. Um, in 2000, Gloral went back and digitized the pre-96 paper charts so that they were now available digital. So now we had everything digital. Um, I believe this was actually on like a five kilometer resolution, but then it was later um, upscaled to two and a half. Um, and then in 2008, um, just because there was um, better technology available, um, computers had more disk space essentially um the chart resolution increased so it went from two and a half to 1.8 kilometers so it's, um, basically double resolution so it had much better resolution for the for the, the ice data um and i mentioned i think maybe there's some weird formatting going at the on at the top um but the temporal frequency also changed so in the 70s and 80s ice cover was observed basically once per week then it was two to four times per week. And then eventually it was daily after 2011. So we have this really great data set, um, but it's on two different grids. And it's also not um, necessarily consistent as far as um, temporal frequency. Um, so it's hard to do any sort of analysis with. So in, in 2019 and then published in 2020, um, we standardized the data set. Um, so you can read about it in this, this uh, paper we put out in Scientific Data um, that uh, we were very meticulous about how we did the, the resampling. So we didn't want to interpolate because we didn't, we didn't want to smooth the data in any sort of way. So we wanted to preserve it and preserve lake wide averages and even um, sub region averages. So we're very meticulous about how we did it. And uh, as a result, the data is now available all on this 1.8 kilometer grid um, and it's all available daily as well. Got a little, sorry, a little ice there. Um, how ironic. Um, so, so yeah, so that's the history, um, but I want to talk about like, you know, what we can learn from this data, which I think is really important. Um, so for, for these large scale trends that I'm going to be, be talking about, um, I'm going to define three different metrics here. Um, and I'll, I hope to not describe the metrics more than actually um, get, get into the, the trends, but um, I'll do my best. So annual max, the seasonal average and the ice duration. Um, and I've got this graphic and I'll sort of walk through this graphic. This is what I showed you before. This is the time series for each of the 51 years. Um, and I'm gonna sort of use that to illustrate these different metrics. So the annual max is, is pretty easy to interpret. It's just the highest value for, for, each, um, for each year that, that ice cover um, achieved essentially. Um, and I'm highlighting that with these circles on this graph. And I think it's interesting to look at because again, it's super variable, you know, 10% some years, 80% others. Um, but it also, the, the timing of year that it occurs is also quite variable. Um, so I just think that that graph shows that. Um, for the, the trend analysis, I'm not actually considering what time of year it happens. It's just what was the max on what year to basically build a time series and then do a regression on. Um, for the seasonal average, um, I'm defining the seasonal average as a temporal mean for January, February, and March, just those three months. And I'm highlighting that here on the graph to show that there's a lot of data missing outside this window on the shoulder seasons. And you might say, well, that's, that's where a lot of change is happening. And you're right. Um, the problem is that in the 70s and 80s, um, ice cover often wasn't recorded until it was a you know four or five percent um 
like base and wide. So there's missing data essentially outside this window. And if we're doing any sort of ranking of years or trend analysis, you can't have missing data in the earlier years. Um, so by restricting the window, we are losing some of this information, um, but it gives us a more rigorous um, uh, trend assessment basically. Um, and isolation sort of comes to the rescue for that because that, um, in all cases, when ice was um, observed for the first time, it was below 10%. So we can be reasonably confident that we have all of the, the data when ice was above 10%. So the ice duration is basically just a count of how many days throughout a given season ice was above 10%. Um, and another way, to, if you remember this graphic that I showed at the beginning, another way to interpret that, that's basically like the sum of each of these vertical columns, like, you know, how many days per season ice was above 10%. So you can think of it that way if it's a little easier. So like I said, I've probably spent too much time defining the metrics than talking about them. They're all um, correlated. That's a, a story for another day. Um, and they're all decreasing as you'll see in just a second. So the, um, the max ice cover, this is the time series for the max ice cover. So you're seeing the y-axis from zero to 100%. And then these are each of the years. So you can see again, you know, it's super variable. Um, super high highs, super low lows. Um, there's sort of this interesting trend, loose trend that you can see um, in, in recent years where we have consecutive high ice years followed by consecutive low ice years. Um, not super, super consistent, but something that's sort of interesting to observe. Um, is, it, is it decreasing? Um, so it's hard to look at this and say, but you know, statistics sort of comes to the rescue. So we can do a, you know, a man Kendall um, uh, linear regression and um, the, the trend is it's decreasing by about a half percent per year. Um, or 5% per decade. If you still believe in p-values, this is significant at the 95% level. Um, I won't show you the time series just for sake of time for the seasonal average, uh, but it has a similar trend. So about 0.4% per year, um, significant at the 99% level, so um, more statistically significant. Um, and then I'll also show you the, the ice duration. Um, so now the y-axis is from zero days to 140 days. So this is the that third metric that I mentioned. Um, I just think it's pretty remarkable to point out that the shortest ice season um, was followed by the longest ice season two years later. So in, in 20, I don't have a pointer, but in 2012 was the lowest ice, ice season, shortest ice season. So it was only four days that were above 10%. Um, 2013 was, was like moderate. And then 2014 was the longest ice season. So I just think that's remarkable that they were the, the shortest and longest were only two years apart. Um, the, the, the trend for this data is even, uh, it's much simpler to remember. Uh, it's 1.0 days per year. Um, and this is significant at the 99% level. So this basically tells you that the ice on the Great Lakes is, is decreasing by one day per, ye per year as far as the length of the season. Um, and this is something that we wouldn't, we wouldn't know without this data set, right? Um, you can, you know, people, you talk to people that live in the Great Lakes and they say, it seems like there's less ice. It seems like there's less ice. But if you don't have, you know, a really high resolution data set, then you can't do that. So you can't say that, you know, quantitatively um, with any sort of confidence. Um, you can, of course, repeat this for individual lakes. Uh, everything that I was showing was just for the, the, the five lake average. Um, I don't expect you to read all these numbers. I'll just say that Superior is decreasing faster than the other lakes, about three quarters of a percent per year um, versus um, the, you know, the half percent that I mentioned before and a little bit more than a day per year um, for the duration. Uh, 2024 also set some records. It was the fourth lowest max on record, uh, the second shortest season to, to the four day season in 2012 that I mentioned. Um, and the seasonal average was actually record low. So um, it's sort of interesting that these things, even though they're correlated, they don't all show the same um, extremes. So if you look at the lowest and highest year for each of these metrics, they're actually all different. So I think it's important to use these different metrics to understand the, the, the trends in the ice data um, in a sort of comprehensive way. So I'll just touch on um, the last decade of research. Um, so I'm, I, I sort of apologize for not um, talking about all the good tech memos and other, other publications that have happened um, not in the last 10 years, but a lot of that information made it into the history of the data. Um, so hopefully it's, it's still well represented. Um, so I'll go through this quite quickly. Quickly, I'm just um, sort of giving you um, an idea and you can you know, look up these papers if you're interested um, in learning more. So it, Mason et al. in 2016 um, looked at uh, ice cover and lake surface temperature relationships um, in specific subregions, um, doing some sort of change point analysis and other things. Um, so those subregions wouldn't have been possible without, again, high resolution data that's geospatially referenced. So it's super, val super valuable. You can't just look at lake wide um, values all the time. You need to look at what's going on at, at finer scales. Um, in 2018, um, we looked at validating um, the ice model, which is now part of the coastal forecast system that, um, that you heard Dave Schwab talk about. So that's, this is uh, 72 hours of just ice um, evolution on Lake Superior on the lower right. Um, the upper, upper right is just showing the validation for the model. So again, looking using 10% as the, the, uh, the threshold for on or off. Um, that's sort of the validation for the, for the different lakes and the different years um, shown above that. 
um, in 2022, um, Lynn et al. looked at um, land fast ice modeling. Um, and again, this wouldn't be possible without the ice classification that's made possible. So again, the, the ice types are really important as well. Um, same author, actually same year, uh, he was very busy, um, put out this great paper looking at um, not just the fact that ice cover is highly variable, but that it's actually increasing in variability and that that's related to teleconnection changes. Um, great paper, um, a lot to digest there. Um, so in summary, uh, ice cover is extremely variable. Um, it's decreasing all the metrics we looked at. Um, observations like this are really key for understanding the physical mechanisms and making meaningful, meaningful predictions. Um, having 51 years of continuous high resolu resolution data of anything is I think really important for climate studies. The fact that it's ice cover is remarkable. I mean, ice cover is such an interesting, such a key climate indicator, but such an interesting thing to look at because it's either there or it's not. It's not like temperature that's on a spectrum. Um, and last, I just want to express gratitude for everyone who made this data set possible. I'm honored to, to be able to manage it. Um, I don't know if I'll be able to manage it for another 50 years. I hope I'm retired before then. Um, but, but yeah, I'm, I'm happy to contribute. So, so thanks. Thanks, James. Uh, we just have a couple minutes for questions. Jesse has one over there. You mentioned ice is decreasing. Um, is the variability, can you talk a little bit more about is the variability in ice coverage increasing over this time period? Does that make sense what I'm saying? Yes. Um, so read this paper. It, like I would, I would highly recommend reading this paper because it's, it is, it is changing. It is changing in, in variability that it's becoming more variable, but the way that it is, is, is very complicated. Um, it, this paper specifically looks at how variable it was pre 97, 98 El Nino and post 97 El Nino. Um, and there's, yeah, there's a lot to unpack. I don't want to, I don't want to uh, misrepresent it. For a great question. Yeah, great stuff. Um, so this is all about aerial coverage. What are the prospects for um, starting to characterize ice thickness in the future? Yeah, great question. So, um, so there is there is uh, ice thickness data available from the U.S. National Ice Center. I didn't I didn't include that um, necessarily in this talk because it's only been available for about the past decade. Um, it's 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 represented as um, ice stage. So it's actually it's actually really it's officially it's the ice age and there's there are thicknesses that are um that correspond to that age so they're tracking basically the individual flows and paying attention to how long those flows have been there and then using freezing degree degree so they're sort of they're sort of modeling the thickness and giving that that making that data available so it is available but it's sort of um it's sort of still model data to some degree. There's certainly from from talking to people at US Nick, there's a lot more uncertainty in that data than there in there is in the ice coverage data that they're much more confident in. Um, but I'm curious to see with these super high res um, products like like SWAT and the other things that are available that are, you know, if you can get the freeboard thickness of height of ice, you can back out the total thickness. Um, so I, I think that we may actually have true sort of observed products in the near future for four thickness. <laughs> 